Gene, I think we should go into uh, one thing that a lot of people are completely unfamiliar with. I mean, they, you know, some people have been listening to you maybe for two, three, five years. But a lot of people don't know about I Libertine. And I'd, I'd like to have you rehash that story. We've never done it on the air. No, I don't think no, we've never had. And that, that is a great story. Are you familiar with the I Libertine story? Uh, I have to be refreshed. I don't well, recall that. Do it. Gene, tell us well, how, how the whole thing started. That's I'll, quite a story. I, uh, Mark, this is very strange. It, uh, it was a progression of peculiar events that led to an, uh, an international, in fact, a worldwide story. I'm surprised you don't remember it. Maybe you will remember it when you're refreshed on it. But when I first came to New York, Bob, I was on all night on WOR. I was on late at night. I was broadcasting from the transmitter at WOR. Not in Carteret. Yeah, and in those days, I, this this really was a turning point in radio, although at the time nobody really knew it. In those days, radio was a very, very formatized form of entertainment. It was format all the way down the line. And the formats, uh, there were disc jockeys, and they had a they had a stranglehold on the industry. And uh, it really, radio really was an, was an adjunct of the music business. And then there were a few newscasters on. And that was about the extent of it. And I, I had come out of the Midwest, and I had an idea that, that radio as a personal form of communication, a personal artistic medium, in other words, to use radio to, 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 to say things and to do things, which have a very personal meaning for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not plugging uh, Pat Boone's records or interviewing some lady who draws pictures on velvet cats. Uh, but uh, I used radio the same way that a writer uses a sheet of paper to say what he has to say about the world. Well, this was very peculiar. You know, it's not, it's not really been done. And I, I was on late at night, and the, the the time was a very peculiar time. It was during the time of Eisenhower, and there was a lot of. It was the beginning, the very beginnings of what later became known as the black comedy period in America. Satire was unknown. There was a lot of comedy. Today we call comedy satire. There is really still very little satire around. Most people today call a comic a satirist. Not so. Uh, and also, I don't consider a man who, who does political gags a, a satirist. That's often called a satirist. Mm -hmm. He's really just a polemicist. But I'm on late at night and I'm doing this stuff and, and uh, working away seven days a week and it was hot. It was the middle of summer. And uh, I had become, I was new in New York, and I had, I suddenly became aware that New York is almost entirely a city that really does run on lists. The first time I really ran into uh, the hit syndrome, that if Brooks Atkinson, who was writing in those days, said a show was a hit, it was a hit. Mm -hmm. If he said it was good, it was good, even if the people who went to see it fell asleep. And they thought they... They were failing both back and forth. I was fascinated by it, you see. Uh, and in New York, the, the, the ten best dressed people are talked about on the radio all over New York, and television. And they don't, they don't even think about this in Cleveland or Cincinnati. It's a New York phenomenon. And it just began to interest me. And one night, late at night, I'm on the air and I said, you know, has it ever occurred to you, friends, that these lists are compiled by mortals, and that they are human just like you are, and in fact, they have many more access to grain than you. Now, we all laugh at, say, uh, the Academy Awards. Have you ever been asked to vote on the best movie? All we do is mm. sit and somebody hands somebody else a statue, and that's the best movie of the year. And I said, is it really? <laughs> you really, is it really? You're not supposed to think that way. <laughs> I know it. And I'm doing this stuff late at night. And I says, now, now I says, now I'll carry it even further. I said, we, uh, that no matter who you are in New York, you're influenced by these lists. I says, you, now you may laugh at the one that's in the Daily News, because you read the Times. And somehow, if it says the top ten bestsellers in the New York Times, you really do think, you may mm -hmm. never have even seen a copy of those bestsellers. But because it's in the time, it's authentic. I said, has it occurred to you that there's a little guy who is bugged because for four years he was on obituaries 
and he's always had this dream of being Walter Lippmann, 17 years, and now he's got this desk, and all he does every Monday is call these little schlock book dealers around town and says, oh, what's selling this yeah. week, man? And, 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 and I says, now let's take it even further. You'll read this little thing at the bottom. It says, this is a, a list that is made up of, let's say, 422 authentic books that deal. Yeah. Said, well, let's go back to the book dealer. And so we go into the bookstore, and here's this guy, this Fred Applerod, he's the book buyer, see, and he bought 500 copies of Who Shot John yes. three months ago, and he's got 497 of them. <laughs> yes. So, Boy, they're going. Yeah, there. so he, turns, he <laughs> says to Mr. So-and-so who calls, why, Who Shot John is moving here, I'll tell you, there's nothing <laughs> like it. I said, four or five other guys say the same thing, and the next thing you know, Who Shot John is number four. Yes. <laughs> and all the people who believe in this rush out like mad and buy it. And then it becomes an authentic. Well, this is true. true of course sure. it's true. Yeah. Well, people were calling up and they said, this is ridiculous. How can this be? What do you mean? You know, who, uh, this is an authentic list. And I says, all right, I'll tell you what. Let's do, friend. And this is 3 o'clock in the morning. I says, now, the people who believe in lists are asleep. <laughs> I said, because they get up at 7 o'clock, bright and bushy tail to run down to the agency. They buy all the hit show yeah. tickets. You know, they really love Barbra Streisand and all this. And I said, and anybody who's sitting up here at 3 o'clock in the morning secretly has doubts. <laughs> I mean, I said, because a lot of us still got to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning. And why you're sitting here at 3 o'clock in the morning listening to me, I says, there's only two kinds of people, us and them. And they don't know we exist. We're back again. Back to the story of High Liberty. You want to? You really want to hear this? Oh, it's, it's yeah. so great, great honestly. Because yeah. I don't, you know, I don't uh, like to to take over the microphone here. We're all sitting around, kidding around tonight. But uh, that story uh, taught me a lesson, Bob, that I'll never forget. Dick, uh, it taught a lot of people a lesson. Because I was just sitting here talking about things, you know, I, it was a theoretical thing. Now remember, this is ten years ago, when people did, they, uh, they accepted things like bestseller lists as actually authentic. Uh, the top 40 tunes to a person listening, he says, that, yeah, that must be the top 40. And I had learned a lesson earlier on that. I remember a guy once in Cincinnati who, who uh, by public relations, one thing and another, he had a record on the top 30 tunes in the, quote, Bible of showbiz before it was even published. It had never even been published. And here it was number eight. So all the disc jockeys across the country, you see, would get this Bible and say, well, it must be big in Pittsburgh. I haven't gotten my copy yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure enough, uh, when they turned it out, every DJ in the country played the... the, the uh, played the pants off this record because it was it was number three or number six and then it became number one authentically well the, the, the public i guess uh, is not aware of the chicanery that goes into these lists and what they do mean to books and they mean to films one thing or another there's millions riding on that and you and i all know that when millions are riding on things that's when the when the uh, operations get big so i'm I'm doing this thing at late at night. And that was simultaneously, Bob, at the time that I created a term. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an airy feeling to have created a term that has entered the language. Now, you know, you read terms like uh, hot diggity dog. Can you imagine the guy that first said that? Yeah, whack a ding hoy. Well, no, I mean the one who first said it. He created something that has entered the language, like... Uh, Oh, gosh, somebody must have said that the first time. Well, I actually created a term that you see on billboards, you read it in paid papers all the time, and, uh, and it came about on that show. I'm, it's, this is 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, look, and it just hit me out of the blue. I said, you know, there's two kinds of people. I've just, just been thinking about this, really. There's the kind of guy who believes in the world of the office, he really believes in file cabinets. Mm. He believes in luncheons. He believes he, 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 that the day, the, the, that the time from 8 a.m. to 6 in the evening is the time he's alive. The phone call, the, the, yeah. the, the lunch, the appointment. And the time after that is just 
dead time. He yeah. flops down in front of the TV set. He drinks his beer. He goes to sleep. Just waiting for the next day. I said, now that is a day person. His world is the day world. But there's the other guy whose world begins the minute he gets out of that office. And his time is at 4 o'clock in the morning, 2 in the morning. He's his own private world. He's a night person. That's, I created the term night person. And you will find it in the American Dictionary of Slang and Usage, and they credit me with it. Hmm. And I said, and of course, the opposite number is the day person. And they're constantly battling. Only they don't know that they are. So you're sitting in this sales meeting, and here is this guy sitting over here, and he's got this light of, e of ecclesiastical fervor. He believes in Operation Dynamo that you're about to foist on the public. He believes in it, see, and you're sitting there all... William McCormick. McCormick. Yeah, that's right, Bill McCormick. And you're sitting over there, is this guy serious? He really believes in it? And you try to make a funny with him. He says, well, you know, remember what happened to Operation uh, Over the Top? Oh, <laughs> and he looks at you. you know. <laughs> well, of yeah. course, if it hadn't been for Fred and accounting, that would have yeah. gone over. <laughs> well, there's the two, there's the battle, you see, going on. And I said, now, let's face it. It's the day people who buy lists. They are statistically oriented. And they will not go to a hit show unless there is a line of over 100 in front of that box office. I mean, it could be the worst turkey in the world. If they read in the paper it costs $20 to get a ticket, that's better than a $1 ticket. They're oriented to mm -hmm. money. A $5,000 car must be five times better than a $1,000 car, even if the transmission is made out of balsa wood. It's got to be better. Now, that's the statistical mind, and he is the day man. So I said, now, if you think I'm kidding, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, the day man is not listening to us. He can't consider. He thinks we're nuts. He says, he's listening to me, and he says, what's this not talking about? And he goes off, and he gets WPAT on, you know, with that nice Montevani record, you know, <laughs> this, the opiate for the masses. Yeah. See? And uh, I said, I says, now, I says, well, I'll tell you what, let's do. I says, if you think I'm kidding, I said, what do you say tomorrow morning, each one of us walk into a bookstore and ask for a book that we know does not exist? It, 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 we're we're going to create it here. It does not exist. Let's just see what happens. Because the day man will believe that it ha is. And let's see how it works. I said, now look, since we're all in this together, what do you say now? We're going to make this a communal affair. And I'm not... You give me a suggestion for a title. Just call it in. And millions of calls. They were coming from, you know, at night, the 50,000-watt yeah. station at 4 in the morning. I'm getting calls from Alaska. And these guys are giving me all these suggestions for titles. And finally, at, at 4.30 in the morning, it was getting so late, I had to go off at 5.30. I said, okay, okay, it's closed. I picked the title. And some unknown guy called in this title. I... Libertine. I said, now that sounds like a book. I mean, it could be almost anything. I, comma, Libertine. Yeah. I said, now, I'm going to create, an, you got to have an author. Because today, you know, most people, you know, they say, if you read the newest Faulkner, uh, Jacqueline Suzanne's a big yeah. deal, you know. You've got to have an author. All right, I'll create an author. And I sat for a minute, and it just hit me, the name. I says, okay, the author's name is Frederick Ewing. Frederick Roland Ewing. He's British. He was uh, a lieutenant commander in World War II on the North Atlantic, the Murmansk Run. He is now a civil servant in Rhodesia. He is married to Marjorie, a horsewoman from the North Country. He writes extensively for The Observer, and he is known primarily for his pre-World War II broadcast on the third program of the BBC, 18th Century Erotica. And he's a scholar, and I, Libertine, is the first volume of a trilogy on 18th century English court life. And by the way, Mr. Ewing is quite surprised at the success his book is, is enjoying, since it was written primarily for scholars. Those <laughs> people do not misunderstand certain chapters that are there for the purpose of scholarly research. And I said, just go in and say, I would like uh, Ewing's I, Libertine. I says, and if anybody asks you, uh, it's, it's, it was printed by Excelsior Press, yeah. which, by the way, is a subsidiary of Cambridge University Imprint. I said, there is not a bookseller in the country that can argue with Cambridge. 
and a British author who's married to a lady named Marjorie. I says, now you go in and don't crack a smile. Don't do anything. And when, when the man says to you, the first thing, I says, he's also bound by lists. The first thing he'll do, you'll walk in and say, I would like to have a copy of I, Libertine by Frederick Ewing. And he'll say, who published it? You say, Excelsior Press. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, I've heard of them. Uh, just a moment. Um, and he'll take out a list, and he'll look it up, and he'll see that it is not listed. He will turn to you and say, there's no such book. He said, well, I'll go to Double Days then and leave. Well, the next guy that comes in and asks for this, he'll say, uh, uh, it's on order. <laughs> and the third one that comes in, he's going to be on his phone calling the distributor. Yeah. And the distributor's going to say to him, you're out of your bird, Fred. You're being put on. There's no such book. I've got the big list here. And there's nothing like that. Well, if... 422 bookstores call in. He's going to be calling Publishers <laughs> Weekly. And within 20 minutes, Publishers Weekly has collapsed in a pile of rubble. <laughs> and remember, it's a six ninety five book. They don't laugh at a $7 book. I says, now get out and go. And we'll sit back and see what happens. Now remember, every listener knew that book did not exist. And yeah. they knew it didn't exist. Right. I says, now remember, it does not exist. You know this, and let's see what happens. And I says, you let me know tomorrow morning and, and the day after that, give me reports, and I will give them out to the listeners what's happening. Sure enough, <laughs> that, the next day a guy says, you know, he says, for, for years this guy in this A Street bookstore with this beard has had me totally buffaloed. I mean, he stands back at that cash register, and you have a feeling that he wrote Kierkegaard. <laughs> <laughs> that he was behind Schopenhauer when Schopenhauer wrote this stuff. And he says, you know, he used to say things like this. I'd go in and I'd say, uh, you know, I'd, there's something about Marcel Proust. And he says, well, of course, Proust never matured. And he says, you know, I, uh, he says, I went in there today, and I said to this guy, I'd like a copy of I, Liberty by Ewing. And he says he looked up from behind the cash register and said, Ewing, it's about time the public discovered him. <laughs> <laughs> he says, the scales fell from my eyes. He says, he says I learned something. And, 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 and I'm getting these calls from people up. And one woman wrote in, and she, uh, you know, the, two days later, she says she was sitting in her bridge party. And she just casually mentioned, uh, gee, I've been reading uh, I, Liberty. And three ladies started to discuss it. <laughs> They not only had read it, they finished it, and two of them didn't like it. <laughs> and so she says, it was all that. She says, uh, and, and, I, and, and then I got a letter from a kid. At, the, at, at Two weeks later, they're coming in from all over the country saying, what's happening is that people are hearing this, you know, airline pilots were listening. It was spreading to Paris, Rome, Japip, every place else. And, and a guy wrote me a letter. He says, Shepard, he says, this is, he says, don't say anything about this. He says, look at this. And he enclosed in this envelope. He says, I'm a student at a university, which I shall not name. It's in Jersey. I'll pick up ten names. Let's think of some funny name. Rutgers. He was a student at this non-existent school called Rutgers. Thing. And he says, uh, he says I have, I'm in this English, <coughs> this, this history of English writing course. And he said, I wrote a term paper on F.R. Ewing, eclectic historian. And it was about a nine-page paper with footnotes, quotes from <laughs> Ewing's earlier BBC broadcasts, <laughs> references. <laughs> and the thing, he sent it to me, and it had a big red thing on the front of it. It said, Superb Research. <laughs> he got a B plus. Always a B plus. Yeah. Never an and, a. The guy, you know, and the guy says, he says, what? He says, my whole education is probably phony. He says, oh, but there wasn't even a Chaucer. <laughs> you know, this could have been some guy 400 years ago, you know, putting the whole world on. So all of it, and I says, wait, let's sit back. I says, don't say anything, just keep asking. Well, do you know within four weeks there was a piece appeared in the Earl Wilson column. It said, had lunch with Freddie Ewing <laughs> on his way to India with his wife Marjorie. <laughs> oh, no. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> so, you know, and I begin to get frightened, you know, because... It's like a guy who, who stands at the base of a mountain, and he says to himself, gee, I wonder what would happen if I threw a pebble up there. And he throws one up there, and the next thing you know, he's got a 420 trillion ton avalanche yeah. coming down on him. You know, it, it's just incredible. It, this thing pyramided, 
And so I began to get all over. Do you know that, that at the end of the sixth week, one of the funniest things that happened, that one of the book supplements, at that time there were three book supplements published with Sunday newspapers in New York. There was the New York Times book supplement, and there were two others. One of the book supplements had a review of I, Liberty. Now, how could that have happened? Well, now, here's what I said. Now, wait a minute. Now, now that, that goes I... into later. Now, uh, this is the truth. I've got it all in clippings. I know. I, I know it's the truth. Now, how? how it happened was my listeners all over the place, even book reviewers, were foisting it on people. Oh. They were calling up editors, I'd like to review this new book. And they, they, see, listeners were beginning to throw their... And I says, any place you can throw your little hooker in, let's do it and see what happens. So some PR man <laughs> wrote to, to one of the columnists, and next thing you know, they're having lunch with Freddie, Freddie Ewing's. <laughs> Well, these, these comments about Ewing began to appear all over in the newspapers. And the final upshot of it all was, I'm getting letters from people who says, you know, the, uh, the other day the, the, my boss asked me if I read it. So what do I say? So my boss reads all the book club books. And he's, he's waiting for it to come in the book club, you know. And the boss, he says, it's all this stuff. And one day, the final one, it, it scared me. I, Libertine was on the proscribed list. It was banned by a very prominent church. Oh, you remain nameless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah, I didn't know. By the that, Boston that Diocese. No, this this blew the gap. I said, <laughs> <laughs> and, and my listeners are staggering. You know, <laughs> what, what they, and, and what do you think at the end of the seventh week? It is on a nationwide bestseller list. But, Gene, just to interject one, do you mean that it's possible that uh, several hundred people... I'm telling people... you what happened. Yeah, but 700 people that no. have been excommunicated no, 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 for no, reading no, the no, book. No, that's right. Let me... They see you're killing the story, but uh, that, that... I'm telling you what happened. This, this is not a thing for gags. This is just exactly a historical thing. And I'm sitting back there, and all this stuff is happening, see. And about, I'd say, 2 o'clock on a... An, on a oh, it was, I think it was a Wednesday or a Thursday morning, and this has been going for eight weeks now, that it is now a bestseller in Paris, in Rome. They're asking for it in bookstores. They're asking for it in places like Honolulu, everywhere, all over. And, and the people who are asking for it, remember, know that it doesn't exist. That's the important point. Right. They are sitting back and watching the repercussions. And here it is, you know, the, 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 there's no mentions of the book in all kinds of columns and everywhere of people who think it does exist. I says, remember, friends, they think it does. And when we were banned in Boston by a very prominent church, I mean, our whole, whole, our whole world was crumbling. You see, I mean, by now I was a little afraid. You know, next thing you know, the president's going to mention it, you know, <laughs> that he loves this book. See, then I wouldn't believe in anything, you know. <laughs> and, and, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a telephone call, and this guy gets on the, on the phone, very funny voice, and he says, look, he says, Shep, he said, he says, you know, you're right. You touched on something very important. There are two kinds of people in this country, the believers and us. And he said, I am a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And he says, I've listened to this thing from the beginning. He says, it's incredible. And by the way, we had even had a, an editorial, an editorial in life. And, and he said, this is fantastic. And he says, don't you think it's about time to spill the story? And I said, yeah, I think so. I said, this is getting out of hand. And so he came down to the office, and I showed him all this documentary proof. And he went back to his office, and he worked on this piece and on Wednesday afternoon, on this August, hot August day, it appeared front page, middle, two, three uh -huh. column banner. It says, gigantic literary hoax. Shows the, the, real, the real phoniness behind a lot of the things that people believe in, like lists and so on. And he had the whole thing documented. Well, that came out on the newsstands at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was sitting in my office... It was fantastic. At 3.01, I would say with it between 3.01 and 3.05, there were six countries on the phone calling me about that. Melbourne was calling. Rome was calling. <coughs> newspaper editors, Figaro, the German newspapers, oh. everywhere. It was a fantastic story. And, and that story, it's probably one of the very few stories that has ever been printed 
word for word, taken out of the Wall Street Journal and reprinted in Pravda. It was printed exactly word for word. Well, well, this thing just blew to the point where, where people were calling from all over. And then, it, it, it was never at any point was there any PR involved. It was a, a whole series of forces that came together. And I think that time, that particular year, was the beginning of the whole new attitude that people have today towards things which they never questioned. People today question politicians. They never did, really. They used to say things about it, but today they really question. Uh, people look at things, and it was the beginning, and I'm not saying that started it. I'm saying that was the beginning uh, of, a, of a whole thing. After that, Mort Saul grew and Money Bruce, and the whole, the whole thing changed over almost, almost in that period overnight. It just began to mushroom. Isn't there and, more to that story about the book? Oh, there's much more, but we, 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 oh. we don't have that time. Am I crazy, or did I read that, that somebody eventually wrote a book? No, later then. You see, when it was... Uh, finally, later on, about you a... See, you know. you're, you're going ahead again. Then, so then uh, one day, a friend of mine, a writer, Ted Sturgeon, Ted right, Sturgeon right. called me one day and, and said, listen, he says, you know, he says, there's this publisher who, he says, he's a paperback publisher, and he says, you have got him taking... He says, this guy is going around all over the world trying to get the paperback print, <laughs> reprints, <laughs> rights on I Love Day. And so he says, let's have lunch with him. And he says, let's have kick. So I sat down with him. And he says, uh, we were eating lunch, and he turns to him, and he said, listen, he said, would you like to meet, the, the publisher was Ian Ballantyne, Ballantyne, he yeah. said, would you like to meet I Liber would you like to meet Fred Ewing? And, and Ian is a very innocent type guy, he says, yeah, he says, I certainly would. He says, I'd be very interested in meeting him. And he says, well, here he is, sitting right here. Hmm. And that lunch... We decided, he says, well, let's turn out I Liberty, hmm. and all yeah. the day people will buy it. The night people will not. <laughs> we finally, and, and, and we turned all the, we took, we took all the profits of the thing, by the way, and turned it over to charity, in case you're interested. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. No. It was not a, a, a commercial deal in, in any sense of the word. So we put this baby on, and sure enough, we, we together, he and I, we, we banged this thing out, you know, we're sitting like, <laughs> like and, and it became a bestseller, genuinely after that but the whole mm. the whole progression of this thing so, now in america this is and then i the, the 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 further lesson that all of my listeners learned was the way it was reported in the press it says things like a uh, disc jockey uh sells non-existent book to listeners yeah. exactly mm -hmm. in the reverse the listeners sold a non-existent book to the world it was a very and they went on you know they didn't want to admit they even had, had yeah. Well, no, no, not that they got took. That the thing was a comment on the entire structure of the official critic, the official layer down of the eight best dressed people. Newspapers go for this kind of stuff. The ten best seller books. They're the final. It still happens today, though. Yeah. It still it does. Still it never changed. Oh, well, no, no, wait. No, no, excuse me. No, no, don't go into that. We know that it, it still goes today. But I'm saying this is why it was never reported and, and analyzed for what it really was, except overseas, that the British press loved this. And just a few years ago, that story, which you don't even remember, interestingly enough, it's been forgotten in America, but all over the world it is recognized as a real comment on the public relations world, uh, the, the world of the, of the glib uh, newspaper writer, the, the, the whole thing, the, the official lists. And the Daily Express of London, a few years ago, picked the 50 greatest hoaxes of the 20th century up to that time, which was 1962 or 63. And I, Libertine, they gave it a, a great big spread. Hmm. It was one of the great hoaxes of all time. So it wasn't just a little gag that it no, got. No, it, no, that's it. Yeah. No, it had a, it had over uh, over season. Now many times we've heard the story of somebody who creates a non-existent thing and gets little plugs in the paper and all right. that. But that's not what we did. This was very different. And when your book is banned, that's something else. 